heard the claims. Red wine reduces cholesterol. Stress during pregnancy can harm your baby. Alcohol kills brain cells. But are they true? In labs around the world, researchers are on a quest to find out. Researchers like me. I'm Dr. Jennifer Gardy, and I'm a molecular biologist with one goal, to separate fact from fiction. Here's the thing about scientists. We're really curious. So when I hear the latest health claims, I have to wonder, are they actually true? <laughs> like this one. If you've got a cold, you're only contagious when symptoms appear, and then just for a couple of days. Science fact or science fiction? Check this out. This is the rhinovirus, the infectious agent behind most common colds. When you're sick, you shed billions of these through your nose and mouth. But not just when symptoms appear. We begin shedding virus before the runny nose and cough arrive, and we can keep shedding for up to four weeks after we feel better. Bless you. Myth busted. But there are hundreds more like it. My mission is to put these claims under the microscope and discover once and for all whether they're myth or science. humans, we're defined by our struggle to coexist with nature. And let me tell you, I can attest to this one firsthand. Like most women, I'm totally convinced that mosquitoes are more attracted to me than to men. But am I right? To get to the bottom of the mosquito claim, I've come here to the swamps of central Florida. Believe it or not, this is the U.S. government's headquarters for mosquito research. And deep in the mangroves is the Mosquito and Fly Research Center. And the guy leading the U.S. assault on this nasty arthropod? Dr. Uli Bernier. Well, Jen, the emphasis of, of most of the research that we do here is, is related to our military and protection of the, the troops from disease. Mm -hmm. These are the guys that invented DEET and this military uniform impregnated with repellent, all aimed at cutting death by mosquito. In conflicts, the diseases that have been transmitted by arthropods have been the number one reason that we lose soldiers, both in combat time and uh, death. But after decades of fighting mosquitoes with repellents, Dr. Bernier is searching for a new holy grail, a compound that will attract mosquitoes and lure them away from people. So what makes us mosquito magnets? The carbon dioxide in our breath, right? To see, we're gonna pit CO2 against the other thing we give off, our scent. Ugh, I'm so wimping out. Body odor is what I'm really talking about. Interesting. All right, so All right, we're gonna put CO2 in this port. I'm gonna put CO2 on the right-hand side. For this test, Dr. Bernier pumps carbon dioxide into one side of an olfactometer, a device used to compare the attractiveness of two different things. Put my arm in this port. A source of body odor goes in the other side. Science is so humbling. And now that we're situated, I if you could go ahead and open the door. the door. Oh my gosh. Release the mosquitoes. Negative air pressure draws the smell of the bait into the cage, and the mosquitoes fly into the tube with the most attractive scent. Oh my god, they're all coming into my tube. That's amazing. It's it's like a feeding frenzy. The CO2 drew an offer on this one. It was just absolutely a butt kicking. For mosquitoes, BO is obviously the smell of choice. But to prove our claim, we need to discover if there's something special in female body odor that makes us more attractive than men. Dr. Bernier has a deceptively simple way to find out. All right, time for the Skeeter Showdown, Gertie versus Bernier. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Yeah, I got you on this one. It's All a straightforward right. test, a little hand-to-hand -hand combat. My arm versus Dr. Bernier. No, they don't care about you. You're old news to them. I'm hot new blood. Ready? All right. Count us down. One. <laughs> one. All right. Bring it on, fun <laughs> guy. If there is something different in my odor, 
I should kick Dr. Bernier's butt. Come on. How many of you got? Um, uh, two thirds of the cake. Oh, God. But I don't. Dr. B wins hands down. Part of the reason is that our odor profiles are constantly changing. You and I go up and down in our mosquito attraction from day to day, including any, within the same day we go up and down in our levels of attraction. It's such a complex problem, and the, the odor profiles, when you compare the chemistry of what you and I produce as uh, males and females, we look about the same. Myth busted. But if gender doesn't determine our attractiveness to mosquitoes, what does? Digging deeper, Dr. Bernier discovers that human odor is composed of over 300 distinct chemical compounds. He manages to manufacture a synthetic version of each, and after hundreds of attempts to craft the perfect combination, creates this. We've been studying this problem for decades, and so far the best we have is this blend right here, and it's only three compounds. If that's the best thing you've come up with in decades, I'm really curious to see how it compares against my skin. All right, let's go. Three compounds, it has lactic acid, acetone, and dimethyl disulfide, and this is the best thing that we have that acts like a human in these experiments that we do. If Dr. Bernier has formulated the perfect combination of odors, his blend should be irresistible. Here we go. The door has been opened. Some activity, but not very much. The synthetic attractant isn't very, well, attractive. So you can see that a lot of mosquitoes have come up and they figured out that you are definitely the more attractive blend of, of chemicals being released, even though your skin chemicals are re releasing a much lower concentration of compounds. Just three compounds that we have on the blend side has only captured two mosquitoes and that's just not good enough. For Dr. Bernier, there are no easy answers when it comes to mosquitoes and humans. Despite the best we can throw at it, the search for the perfect mosquito elixir remains so elusive that the battle with skeeters continues, and the battle between man and woman. Okay, come on, bug guy, best two out of three. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Yeah, I got you on this one. Come to mommy. More, over here, no! For as long as humans have been battling mosquitoes, we've also been doing something else to survive. Grilling meat. It's such a fundamental part of our lives, we've never even thought to put it under the microscope. Until now. Here's one you've probably heard before. One hot dog, please. Thank you. Eating meat that's been grilled over an open flame, like my hot dog here, can potentially increase your risk of cancer. But is it true? Well, a team of scientists right here in Manhattan is trying to figure that out. Dr. Hello, Tang, hi. Dr. Dr. Deliang Tang from Columbia University is one of the world's leading cancer researchers. For this claim, he's delving into the molecular structure of prostates removed because they were cancerous. Those are the slides they select from their repository. And this is from a, a patient who has prostate cancer. This way, please. Dr. Tang and his team have gathered prostate tissue from the Henry Ford Health System in Detroit, where more than 250 men lost their prostate to cancer. They already know that when red meat is cooked for too long at very high temperatures, a group of chemicals is produced. They're called heterocyclic amines, or HCAs. When we ingest them, they penetrate our cells and bind to our DNA. In Dr. Tang's lab, each sample of prostate tissue is treated with an antibody. It identifies exactly where HCAs have impacted the DNA. If the prostate tissue turns brown, it's proof positive that HCAs have been present. Oh my gosh, that, that's really brown. But it's what HCAs do to our genetic material that's frightening. When these chemicals bind to our DNA, they damage it. If this injury occurs where cell division is regulated, it could cause a mutation that turns a healthy cell into a cancerous one. So basically what we're looking at here is a sample of prostate tissue that is absolutely full of HCA and you can see the damage that it's done to the DNA. 
That's correct. That's correct. And uh, if those DNA damage was not being repaired, then they will cause mutation and will lead to further damage in the carcinogenesis process. For the men in this study, prostate cancer was the final outcome. In each case, their prostate tissue was riddled with DNA damage. And when Dr. Tang correlated that damage to their diet, he made a critical discovery. Yeah, based on our study, the level of DNA damage is positively uh, correlated with the consumption of uh, grilled red meat. Got it. More grilled red meat equals more DNA damage. That's correct. Claim proven. By probing the genetic structure of our DNA, Dr. Tang and other researchers believe that for thousands of years, we've been unwittingly increasing our risk of getting prostate, stomach, colorectal, and breast cancer by grilling our meat for too long at temperatures that are too high. But don't sell the barbecue just yet. The way we cook our red meat is potentially dangerous. But who wants to give up that perfectly grilled burger? Not me. But according to another claim that's out there, I may not have to. Supposedly, soaking red meat in a marinade or mixing it with rosemary before grilling it can reduce the formation of HCAs. Sounds great, but is it fact or fiction? Hi, Chef Nicholas. Hi, Jennifer. To help me find out, I'm turning to a guy who's grilled for celebrities, senators, and CEOs, Chef Nicholas Heidemann. So what have you got ready for us over there? These steaks have been marinated for uh, two hours. Mm -hmm. And this one here is of uh, Caribbean style. Nice rosemary on that one. Yes, that's uh, correct. Good. And this one here is a herb that's been uh, marinating for uh, two hours. Another marinade with lots of rosemary. And I also have a um, rosemary burger, mm -hmm. right? And also part of the experiment are uh, the controlled meats. Perfect. So those right. have got no marinades whatsoever. Yes, that's Those correct. are going to be really, really helpful in terms of our final comparison. Our plan's simple. Try to deliberately create HCAs by grilling this meat for too long at a very high heat, about 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Not Chef Nick's usual haute cuisine grilling, but most of us are guilty of barbecuing just like this at home. These are uh, done, and they've done uh, really well done. <laughs> They're well cooked. <laughs> it's mm. a little too well done for my taste, but you know what? It's absolutely perfect for the experiment that we're going to do. Next step, calculate the amount of HCAs in each piece of meat. Hi, Frank. Hello, Jennifer. How are you? Good, so good. What do we have here today? A lot of meat. Can we help you with All that? All right. See, this is our control. Okay, excellent. That's got no marinade on it. Okay. Yeah. Measuring the concentration of HCAs is a highly specialized task, but Frank Martinuzzi is an expert. Oh, it hurts to do this to a steak. I think that'll do it. It's a long way from Dr. Tang's lab in New York, but our ability to fight HCAs depends on what we discover in this sample. We're just loading up the vials. The final step, measure the amount of HCAs, down to one billionth of a gram. We can also use the height of the peak in order to determine the concentration of the sample. So, what impact, if any, did rosemary have on the production of HCAs? The results confirm the findings of a much larger study done at Kansas State University. On this axis are HCA levels, and on this axis are three seasonings. Amazingly, the herb marinade reduced HCA levels by 72%, the rosemary by 84%, and the Caribbean marinade by a staggering 88%. All dramatic decreases in HCA levels. But how does it do it? During grilling, the intense heat causes amino acids and sugars to combine to create something called free radicals, the precursors of the dreaded HCAs. Rosemary and other herbs contain compounds called antioxidants that go after the free radicals and mop them up. Fewer free radicals mean fewer HCAs. Claim proven. Rosemary and seasonings containing rosemary really do make your grilled meat safer. So rosemary really is a great antioxidant. The same claim is often made about red wine, and you know what? 
It's true. Red wine contains polyphenols that act just like the compounds in rosemary and may also prevent Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, and heart attacks. Next, does drinking alcohol on a cold day actually warm you up? To find out, I risk my liver and put myself at the mercy of an expert on cold physiology, a man they call Professor Popsicle. I hate being cold. Most people do, actually, which is probably why there are so many myths that have to do with cold temperatures. Things like we lose most of our body heat through our head, or drinking alcohol on a cold day will warm you up. But figuring out whether these claims are fact or fiction isn't as easy as it sounds. First, we have to understand the secrets of cold physiology. And that's why we've come here, to the laboratory of the man they call Professor Popsicle. Professor Gordon Giesbrecht is a world-renowned expert on hypothermia. He's also famous for throwing himself into his work, which is how he got the nickname. Well, I've done hundreds of cooling experiments, and uh, in many cases I've been the subject because I wanted to be able to actually experience our studies and be able to understand the effects of cold more. Just the guy to help us with our first cold claim. Will a shot of alcohol warm you up on a cold day? Myth or science? To find out, Professor G has assigned me three simple tasks. Get cold, get drunk, then get my temperature taken in some very unusual ways. An infrared thermal camera will capture the temperature of my skin. Light colors show where I'm hot, dark colors where I'm cold. This mini thermometer will measure my core temperature. I swallowed one a few hours ago. That was fun. Shouldn't be long now before I hit the point of intoxication. Whew, I'm not there already. I am starting to feel different. I've stopped shaking and I've just noticed there's a policeman in the freezer. Hey, Jenna, I just need you to blow in here until I tell you to stop blowing, okay? Okay. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, stop. So you're point one zero six, Jen, so that's well over the legal limit. I won't drive. Do you feel warmer? Much warmer. And uh, I don't have to ask, but you certainly aren't shivering anymore. No, no, I'm fine. So what we've shown is in a cold room, with cold stress equally to your head and to your torso, mm -hmm. you, uh, you're not shivering, you don't feel cold, and if we look at your infrared thermography picture, you can see that there's actually more area of your skin that is actually white, and so your skin is actually warmed up warmer than it was before you started drinking alcohol. Looks like our claim is true, but I'm guessing it's not as obvious as that. If my skin is warmer, where is the heat coming from? Well, to answer that, we need to actually take a look at your core temperature, check out what it says with the pill, and look at that. You were 37.3 degrees before you started, <laughs> and actually I'm quite surprised. You've actually dropped to 36.3. It may not sound like a lot, but this decrease in my core temperature is already extremely dangerous. I'm surprised that with that little bit of cold stress that we gave Jen, that her core temperature actually dropped one full degree Celsius. Now, if you put somebody outside uh, in the winter, for instance, and they've been drinking a lot, you know, it wouldn't take much more stress for the core temperature to drop two or three more degrees. And now you have a clinically hypothermic person and, uh, you know, unless they uh, somehow get out of that cold, they're significantly at risk. Problem is, like me, they won't notice their drop in core body temperature. Thanks to the alcohol, they'll feel warm. It's one of the deadliest illusions of hypothermia. Normally, when we get cold, the body decreases blood flow to the skin, keeping it near the core to protect our key organs but alcohol reverses this process. It causes blood to flow to the skin, making us feel warmer, but giving off precious heat that causes a dangerous decrease in our core body temperature. So this is where you get the myth. People know that if you drink alcohol, you feel warmer, but you're actually cooling off your body core. Critical knowledge. In the world of Professor breath. 
The difference between myth and science is also the difference between life and death. Cold weather claim number two. Do you lose most of your body heat through your head? To find out, Professor Popsicle is whipping up another little test for us. And when I say us, I mean me. Okay, Jed, come on, have a seat in my office. Your office looks <laughs> cold and well, wet. The military has spent a lot of time studying this one. The answer critical to the cold weather survival of their soldiers. Yeah, so we'll, uh, and according to Professor Giesbrecht, my whole body, including my head, has to be cooled to the same temperature. We're just gonna lift you up, drop you in. Let's Best you way to do that? Put me in water chilled to 14.5 degrees Celsius. No, you need to go down. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh, it, it kind of hurts a little. Like, what? What is happening to my well, skin right now? This is the cold shock response. You've got uh, cold water is stimulating all the receptors in your skin, and they're telling your brain something's going on here. But sitting in the tank isn't good enough. For this experiment, I've got oh, to be completely okay. submerged. Oh. Are you sitting down? You need to go down. Down, down. Here we go. If you feel that you really need to get out, let me know. That's good. You've got a couple more inches and you're under. There you go. Excellent. Good. There. Can you sit down now? Good. Good? He's got to be kidding. You're feeling okay? Give me a thumbs up. Good. So there, that's it. That's as bad as it gets. Okay, Jen. <laughs> okay, let's take that off. We'll take this off. And uh, so how is that? <laughs> Colossally unpleasant. And it doesn't get any better. Now it's time for the thermal camera. <laughs> okay, Jen. So how do you feel? I feel equally cold everywhere. <laughs> but if I am losing most of my heat through my head, it'll show up on the camera as either red or yellow. Okay, so I think when we look at the infrared now, you'll see that your temperature across your body and head is pretty much equal. Proving that you lose an equal amount of heat from any part of your body that's exposed to the cold. Myth busted. It was pretty painful to discover, but you don't lose most of your heat through your head. So good job, you're a real tough cookie. Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. <laughs> Here's another claim. It's easier to sleep in a cool room than a warm one. Well, this one is true. It turns out that a drop in our core body temperature is one of the signals our body uses to tell us when to go to sleep. No drop equals no sleep, which is what happens with many insomniacs. But what if a cold room still won't do the trick? Will counting sheep put you to sleep? Researchers at Oxford University study this one. Really? One group of insomniacs counted sheep, while another pictured a relaxing scene. Scientists discovered that the relaxing scene put the insomniacs to sleep more quickly, while the group counting sheep they just got bored. Here's what my mom used to tell me. Slow down when you eat. It'll help you to lose weight. But was she right? To find out, I go head to head with one of America's fastest food eaters. The wood chipper himself, Dave Coondog Okarma. Our families are a major source of folk wisdom. Tales so old we simply accept them as true. That's my mom. She had a long list of health claims passed down to her through the generations. Mainly don'ts. Don't slouch in your chair, it's bad for your back. Don't eat too quickly, you'll give yourself a tummy ache. But was she right? Here's one I heard a lot. Always use hot water to wash your hands because it kills the germs. Well, it turns out mom was wrong on this one. 
Water needs to be about 110 degrees Fahrenheit in order to kill bacteria, and that's way too hot for these paws. What actually kills the germs is soap. Speaking of which, does antibacterial soap work any better than plain soap? Nope. 27 studies over 26 years have shown that antibacterial soap is no more effective than plain soap at reducing bacteria levels on the hands. Here's another bit of advice from mom. If you eat too fast, you'll gain weight. True, or just an old wives' tale? I've come back to New York to find out. To test this claim, I'm gonna need somebody who can eat fast, really fast. And I've found just the guy. At 15, he beat the state pizza eating champion. At 16, he set a world record by scoffing 45 hard boiled eggs in eight minutes. He's even out eaten a bear. Now, Dave Coondog Okarma, champion fast food eater, has accepted the ultimate challenge. Hey, Coondog. Hi, science chick. <laughs> so we've got a pretty simple experiment set up today. Uh, basically, we want to measure the levels of the hormone that tells us when we're full. So in order to do that, you and I have both been fasting for 12 hours, and we've got a bunch of hot dogs in front of us. You're going to do what you do best, which is eat really fast, and I'm going to eat like a dainty, delicate lady that I am. Okay. And then we're going to take a blood draw, and that's where we're going to look for the hormone. I'm ready, okay? <laughs> You're going down. No. Okay, one, two, three, eat. It's called glucagon-like peptide 1, or GLP-1. It helps us get the nutrients out of our food, but its key role is signaling our brain that we've had enough to eat. That's it, I'm done, I've had it. So what did Coondog and I discover when we went looking for GLP-1 in our blood? Well, our results mirrored the findings of a study conducted in Athens, Greece. 15 minutes after eating, fast eaters like coon dogs showed significantly lower levels of GLP-1 than slow eaters like me. Way to go, Mom. You nailed this one. It turns out you can gain weight if you eat quickly. Your gut doesn't produce as much GLP-1, your brain doesn't get the message that your stomach is full, and as a result, you eat more. It's a result field tested by Dave Coondog Okarma. If I start out slow, I I end up slow. I, I don't I don't get a lot of food down. I do get that full filling, and then I'm fighting that the whole way through. I front load. I, I try to get as much as I can down as fast as I can before I get that feeling. And I could still eat. I could go for a rack of ribs, slab of bacon, gallon of ice cream, a Galapagos turtle. <laughs> Bring it on, baby. Oh man. Everything we consume, even the way we eat it, can have a dramatic impact on our bodies and, as scientists are discovering, on our brain as well. Ice cream is really, really good. But sometimes it's so good that it hurts. You know what I'm talking about. Brain freeze, ice cream headaches, that tightening sensation you get in your temple when you eat something too cold too fast. Most of us probably haven't given much serious thought to brain freeze, but there is a place where they have. The University of Guelph in Canada. And they don't call it Moo for nothing. The food scientists here, like Dr. Massimo Marconi, are world authorities on milk and everything that's made from it. Not only are we specialists in ice cream research, mm -hmm. and this is dates back for approximately 100 years, what we like to do in this particular department is to find out how the food interacts with the mouth. So something like brain freeze would be something which is very important for us. And when it comes to this phenomenon, there's a claim that's been made for a long time. People say brain freeze can only happen on a hot day, but is that a myth or is it science? Delicious. Delicious science. 
Dr. Marconi has the perfect experiment to find out, and he believes it could also provide a unique perspective on how our brain functions. All we need for our test is 12 liters of ice cream and 24 eighth graders from Corselet Public School, all cooled to a delightful at minus four degrees. Oh, and a 53 foot freezer truck. And did I mention the 24 eighth graders? Each student gets a bowl of ice cream and 30 seconds to scoff it down. Dr. Marconi and his assistant, William Babbage, will keep an eagle eye out for brain freeze. Ready, set, go! It doesn't take long. William records the temperature of the cheek and the roof of the mouth to confirm that the body is actually colder than the usual 37 degrees Celsius. Brain freeze! Brain, brain freeze! But there's barely time to get brain the numbers freeze. down. Look at your cheek temperature over here, 21.7. Myth busted. You can get brain freeze on a cold day, and that reveals something unique about how the brain works, or in this case, doesn't work. A brain freeze reaction starts when something cold hits the nerve cluster in the roof of our mouth. The body strikes back by dilating blood vessels in an attempt to warm the area up. But that response is so fast it triggers pain receptors in our face. What carries this sensation to the brain is the trigeminal nerve, which has branches that extend into our forehead, our jaw, and our chin. It's such an extensive network that even though the pain is coming from our mouth, our brain gets confused and tells us it's coming from our forehead. In essence, our brain is lying to our body, and that hurts. Seems even more cruel when we're talking about something as pleasurable as ice cream. But I gotta go. Grade sevens want a science lesson too. brain is capable of making some pretty basic mistakes. So can it really repair itself, even rebuild after being damaged? Those questions are at the heart of another claim. Blind people hear better than those with sight. But is it myth or science? Turns out a team of Canadian researchers is on a quest to find out. Francois Coté is an extraordinary man. Alors, je suis né handicapé visuel, donc c'est de naissance. C'est un glaucome congénital euh, qui a fait que j'ai perdu la vue complètement à l'âge de deux ans. Yet Francois can do anything a sighted person can. J'ai eu la chance de vivre dans une famille où on m'a laissé beaucoup explorer et comme l'enfant. Il n'y a pas de barrière, ça m'a permis de développer ces habiletés-là naturellement, simplement en voulant explorer le monde qui m'entourait. Because of these amazing skills, Francois is at the forefront of a unique experiment. Okay, the chair is here. And watch, because on the other side, there are the speakers. At the Université de Montréal in Canada, Dr. Franco Lepore is putting a group of blind and sighted people through a battery of specially designed hearing tests. Are you comfortable? Mm -hmm. He wants to discover, once and for all, whether blind people hear better than those with sight. In front of you and on the side, there are 16 speakers. There is a sort of urban legend about the fact that blind individuals must have developed their auditory capacities much more okay. than the, the, the sighted okay. person. Good luck. But Dr. Lapore believes that this is more than just legend. Shall we go? Okay, great. To test that hypothesis, subjects are first asked to locate the source of a sound. Even the blind have their eyes covered to remove all possibility of bias. Dr. Lepore's co-investigator is Olivier Collignon. He believes the blind can help us see the brain in a new way. 
we like to see the brain like a functional machine, not a sensory machine. So the brain has to resolve function, and he will do that using the best information he has. And so we have seen that uh, in daily life, we have seen that in our laboratory, and the question is now, we have the suspicion that maybe something is happening in the brain. But the first test results don't support those suspicions. We found that the blind subjects and the sighted subjects have identical performance. Mm -hmm. So we said maybe the fact that they're not any better than the sighted is that the task is maybe too simple. So Lepore and Collignon design a series of more complex experiments to probe deeper. In one, Francois Coté is played two tones. He must decide whether the second tone is higher or lower in pitch than the first, as each pair is played closer and closer together. He proves remarkably adept. Francois picks up the change even when it's ten times faster than the changes recognized by sighted subjects. In another experiment, subjects have to identify the source of the sound again, but this time, one ear is blocked. In every test, the blind come out ahead. On we go. The blind, about half of them, had almost perfect performance. Claim proven, blind people do hear better. But for Dr. Lepore, that only raises a more intriguing question. Why? That answer may lie with Francois Coté. The study revealed that his hearing is so acute it operates like a sonar, allowing him to pick up the reflection of a sound to create a picture of his surroundings, just like a bat. So I have at my left your skate sound, your voice, your presence too. And at my right, I have the board. And if I need with my skate or my cane, I can make a sound to hear where, where we are. And you hear the sound bounce yes. back to you. Yes, yes. That is amazing because I hear the sound of your cane tapping, I hear the sound of our skates, but I do not have the ability to pick up any of those reflections. I just, I don't hear them. I don't mm. understand how they work. Neither does Olivier Collignon, but he has a theory that he's about to test. Is it possible that something is happening in the brain of this subject, that maybe there is some kind of reorganization that could explain this kind of uh, uh, supranormal abilities that uh, this uh, early blind subject have? There are two areas where Olivier wants to search. The temporal lobe that's involved in hearing and the occipital cortex that controls sight. Maybe a good candidate is uh, uh, the occipital cortex, what we call the visual cortex. So maybe Francois is using this part of the brain to process uh, auditory information. This is an hypothesis and we will see if it works with, with Francois. To do that, Olivier uses a very specialized MRI. Francois, tout va bien? Oui. Excellent, c'est parfait pour nous. This machine measures blood flow. If Francois's visual cortex is being used to help him hear, the MRI will show blood flow in this part of the brain. Donc je te rappelle quand tu entends ma voix qui dit gauche droite, tu localises les sons s'ils sont à gauche ou à droite. Et si tu entends ma voix qui dit grave aigu, tu me dis si le son est plutôt grave ou plutôt aigu. Donc on va commencer d'ici quelques secondes. Okay, allez. Gauche droite. As Francois tries to locate the sound, the MRI begins mapping blood flow in his brain. Francois? Oui? C'était parfait, idéal. Ah. Magnifique, en fait, tu as fini, donc on va venir te sortir de la pièce, d'accord? What Olivier discovers is fascinating. This uh, part of the brain, which is at the back here, which is usually dedicated to process visual information, you see that uh, this region of the brain is in fact active when Francois is uh, processing sound. That is absolutely amazing. He's basically seeing with his ears. 
it's still an auditory perception, but yes, you are right, it's using this visual part of the brain to process the sounds. Olivier discovered the same extraordinary phenomenon in other subjects who lost their sight when they were very young. Like Francois, their brain had literally evolved, rewiring itself to replace sight with sound. Alors ça permet de pouvoir patiner librement, de sentir la liberté de mouvement de façon très agréable. are constantly testing the limits of what we know, searching for real-world answers. But what we know comes from more than just what we discover under the microscope. It originates from folk wisdom passed down to our families, from claims you and I have come to accept as truth. Proving whether they're myth or science not only helps us make critical decisions about our health and how we live our lives, but often leads to surprising and unexpected discoveries. So I'm not giving up. I've got more myths to bust. Does eating six meals a day help you lose weight? Will grape juice reduce your chances of a heart attack? Is chocolate really an aphrodisiac? The answers are waiting to be found. Check out what I discover as I continue my quest to separate myth from science.